Michel Foucault. Discipline and Punish. Second Vintage Books Edition, May 1995. Translation Copyright Copyright 1977 by Alan Sheridan. Part 1. Torture. 1. The Body of the Condemned. On March 2, 1757 Damien's the regicide was condemned to make the amende honorable before the main door of the Church of Paris, where he was to be taken and conveyed in a cart, wearing nothing but a shirt, holding a torch of burning wax weighing two pounds, then, in the said cart, to the place de grieve, where, on a scaffold that will be erected there, the flesh will be torn from his breasts, arms, thighs and calves with red-hot pincers, his right hand, holding the knife with which he committed the said parricide, burnt with sulphur, and, on those places where the flesh will be torn away, poured molten lead, boiling oil, burning resin, wax and sulphur melted together and then his body drawn and quartered by four horses and his limbs and body consumed by fire, reduced to ashes and his ashes thrown to the wines, pieces originals, 372-4. Finally, he was quartered, recounts the Gazette d'Amsterdam of April 1, 1757. This last operation was very long, because the horses used were not accustomed to drawing, consequently, instead of four, six were needed, and when that did not suffice, they were forced, in order to cut off the wretch's thighs, to sever the sinews and hack at the joints. It is said that, though he was always a great swearer, no blasphemy escaped his lips, but the excessive pain made him utter horrible cries, and he often repeated, My God, have pity on me. Jesus, help me. The spectators were all edified by the solicitude of the parish priest of St. Paul's who despite his great age did not spare himself in offering consolation to the patient. Bowden, an officer of the watch, left us his account, the sulphur was lit, but the flame was so poor that only the top skin of the hand was burnt, and that only slightly. Then the executioner, his sleeves rolled up, took the steel pincers, which had been especially made for the occasion, and which were about a foot and a half long, and pulled first at the calf of the right leg, then at the thigh and from there at the two fleshy parts of the right arm, then at the breasts. Though a strong, sturdy fellow, this executioner found it so difficult to tear away the pieces of flesh that he set about the same spot two or three times, twisting the pincers as he did so, and what he took away formed at each part a wound about the size of a six-pound crown piece. After these tearings with the pincers, Damien's, who cried out profusely, though without swearing, raised his head and looked at himself. The same executioner dipped an iron spoon in the pot containing the boiling potion, which he poured liberally over each wound. Then the ropes that were to be harnessed to the horses were attached with cords to the patient's body, the horses were then harnessed and placed alongside the arms and legs, one at each limb. Monsieur L. E. Breton, the clerk of the court, went up to the patient several times and asked him if he had anything to say. He said he had not, at each torment, he cried out, as the damned in hell are supposed to cry out, Pardon, my God. Pardon, Lord. Despite all this pain, he raised his head from time to time and looked at himself boldly. The cords had been tied so tightly by the men who pulled the ends that they caused him indescribable pain. Monsieur L. E. Breton went up to him again and asked him if he had anything to say, he said no. Several confessors went up to him and spoke to him at length, he willingly kissed the crucifix that was held out to him, he opened his lips and repeated, Pardon, Lord. The horses tugged hard, each pulling straight on a limb each horse held by an executioner. After a quarter of an hour, the same ceremony was repeated and finally, after several attempts, the direction of the horses had to be changed, thus, those at the arms were made to pull towards the head, those at the thighs towards the arms, which broke the arms at the joints. This was repeated several times without success. He raised his head and looked at himself. Two more horses had to be added to those harnessed to the thighs, which made six horses in all. Without success. Finally, the executioner, Sampson, said to Monsieur L. E. Breton that there was no way or hope of succeeding, and told him to ask their lordships if they wished him to have the prisoner cut into pieces. Monsieur L. E. Breton, who had come down from the town, ordered that renewed efforts be made, and this was done, but the horses gave up and one of those harnessed to the thighs fell to the ground. The confessors returned and spoke to him again. He said to them, I heard him kiss me, gentlemen. The parish priest of St. Paul's did not dare to, so Monsieur de Marcelli slipped under the rope holding the left arm and kissed him on the forehead. The executioners gathered round and Damien's told them not to swear, to carry out their task and that he did not think ill of them, he begged them to pray to God for him, and asked the parish priest of St. Paul's to pray for him at the first Mass. After two or three attempts, 
the executioner Samson and he who had used the pincers each drew out a knife from his pocket and cut the body at the thighs instead of severing the legs at the joints, the four horses gave a tug and carried off the two thighs after them, namely, that of the right side first, the other following, then the same was done to the arms, the shoulders, the armpits, and the four limbs, the flesh had to be cut almost to the bone, the horses pulling hard carried off the right arm first and the other afterwards. When the four limbs had been pulled away, the confessors came to speak to him, but his executioner told them that he was dead, though the truth was that I saw the man move, his lower jaw moving from side to side as if he were talking. One of the executioners even said shortly afterwards that when they had lifted the trunk to throw it on the stake, he was still alive. The four limbs were untied from the ropes and thrown on the stake set up in the enclosure in line with the scaffold, then the trunk and the rest were covered with logs and faggots, and fire was put to the straw mixed with this wood. In accordance with the decree, the whole was reduced to ashes. The last piece to be found in the embers was still burning at half past ten in the evening. The pieces of flesh and the trunk had taken about four hours to burn. The officers of whom I was one, as also was my son, and a detachment of archers remained in the square until nearly eleven o'clock. There were those who made something of the fact that a dog had lain the day before on the grass where the fire had been, had been chased away several times, and had always returned. But it is not difficult to understand that an animal found this place warmer than elsewhere, quoted in Ziva's, 20114. Eighty years later, Leon Faucher drew up his rules for the house of young prisoners in Paris. Art. 17 The prisoners' day will begin at 6 in the morning in winter and at 5 in summer. They will work for 9 hours a day throughout the year. 2 hours a day will be devoted to instruction. Work in the day will end at 9 o'clock in winter and at 8 in summer. Art. 18 Rising. At the first drum roll, the prisoners must rise and dress in silence as the supervisor opens the cell doors. At the second drum roll, they must be dressed and make their beds. At the third, they must line up and proceed to the chapel for morning prayer. There is a five-minute interval between each drum roll. Art. 19 The prayers are conducted by the chaplain and followed by a moral or religious reading. This exercise must not last more than half an hour. Art. 20 Work. At a quarter to six in the summer, a quarter to seven in winter, the prisoners go down into the courtyard where they must wash their hands and faces, and receive their first ration of bread. Immediately afterwards, they form into work teams and go off to work, which must begin at 6 in summer and 7 in winter. Art. 21 Meal. At 10 o'clock the prisoners leave their work and go to the refectory, they wash their hands in their courtyards and assemble in divisions. After the dinner, there is recreation until 20 minutes to 11. Art. 22 School. At 20 minutes to 11, at the drum roll, the prisoners form into ranks, and proceed in divisions to the school. The class lasts two hours and consists alternately of reading, writing, drawing and arithmetic. Art. 23 at 20 minutes to 1, the prisoners leave the school, in divisions, and return to their courtyards for recreation. At 5 minutes to 1, at the drum roll, they form into work teams. Art. 24 at 1 o'clock they must be back in the workshops. They work until 4 o'clock. Art. 25 at 4 o'clock the prisoners leave their workshops and go into the courtyards where they wash their hands and form into divisions for the refectory. Art. 26 supper and the recreation that follows it last until 5 o'clock, the prisoners then return to the workshops. Art. 27 at 7 o'clock in the summer, at 8 in winter, work stops, bread is distributed for the last time in the workshops. For a quarter of an hour one of the prisoners or supervisors reads a passage from some instructive or uplifting work. This is followed by evening prayer. Art. 28 at half past seven in summer, half past eight in winter, the prisoners must be back in their cells after the washing of hands and the inspection of clothes in the courtyard, at the first drum roll, they must undress, and at the second get into bed. The cell doors are closed and the supervisors go the rounds in the corridors, to ensure order and silence, Fauter. 27482. We have, then, a public execution and a timetable. They do not punish the same crimes or the same type of delinquent. But they each define a certain penal style. Less than a century separates them. It was a time when, in Europe and in the United States, the entire economy of punishment was redistributed. It was a time of great scandals for traditional justice, a time of innumerable projects for reform. It saw a new theory of law and crime a new moral or political justification of the right to punish, old laws were abolished, old customs died out. Modern codes were planned or drawn up, Russia, 
1769, Prussia, 1780, Pennsylvania and Tuscany, 1786, Austria, 1788, France, 1791, Year 4, 1808 and 1810. It was a new age for penal justice. Among so many changes, I shall consider one, the disappearance of torture as a public spectacle. Today we are rather inclined to ignore it, perhaps, in its time, it gave rise to too much inflated rhetoric, perhaps it has been attributed too readily and too emphatically to a process of humanization, thus dispensing with the need for further analysis. And, in any case, how important is such a change, when compared with the great institutional transformations, the formulation of explicit, general codes and unified rules of procedure, with the almost universal adoption of the jury system, the definition of the essentially corrective character of the penalty and the tendency, which has become increasingly marked since the 19th century, to adapt punishment to the individual offender? Punishment of a less immediately physical kind, a certain discretion in the art of inflicting pain, a combination of more subtle, more subdued sufferings, deprived of their visible display, should not all this be treated as a special case, an incidental effect of deeper changes? And yet the fact remains that a few decades saw the disappearance of the tortured, dismembered, amputated body, symbolically branded on face or shoulder, exposed alive or dead to public view. The body as the major target of penal repression disappeared. By the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, the gloomy festival of punishment was dying out, though here and there it flickered momentarily into life. In this transformation, two processes were at work. They did not have quite the same chronology or the same raison d'etre. The first was the disappearance of punishment as a spectacle. The ceremonial of punishment tended to decline, it survived only as a new legal or administrative practice. The amende honorable was first abolished in France in 1791, then again in 1830 after a brief revival, the pillory was abolished in France in 1789 and in England in 1837. The use of prisoners in public works, cleaning city streets or repairing the highways, was practiced in Austria, Switzerland and certain of the United States, such as Pennsylvania. These convicts, distinguished by their infamous dress and shaven heads, were brought before the public. The sport of the idle and the vicious, they often become incensed, and naturally took violent revenge upon the aggressors. To prevent them from returning injuries which might be inflicted on them, they were encumbered with iron collars and chains to which bombshells were attached to be dragged along while they performed their degrading service, under the eyes of keepers armed with swords, blunderbusses and other weapons of destruction, Roberts Vox, Notices, 21, quoted in Teeters, 1937, 24. This practice was abolished practically everywhere at the end of the 18th or the beginning of the 19th century. The public exhibition of prisoners was maintained in France in 1831, despite violent criticism a disgusting scene, said Real, CF Bibliography, it was finally abolished in April 1848. While the chain gang, which had dragged convicts across the whole of France, as far as Brest and Toulon, was replaced in 1837 by inconspicuous black painted cell carts. Punishment had gradually ceased to be a spectacle. And whatever theatrical elements it still retained were now downgraded, as if the functions of the penal ceremony were gradually ceasing to be understood, as if this rite that concluded the crime was suspected of being in some undesirable way linked with it. It was as if the punishment was thought to equal, if not to exceed, in savagery the crime itself, to accustom the spectators to a ferocity from which one wished to divert them, to show them the frequency of crime, to make the executioner resemble a criminal, judges murderers, to reverse roles at the last moment, to make the tortured criminal an object of pity or admiration. As early as 1764, Beccaria remarked, the murder that is depicted as a horrible crime is repeated in cold blood, remorselessly, Beccaria, 101. The public execution is now seen as a hearth in which violence bursts again into flame. Punishment, then, will tend to become the most hidden part of the penal process. This has several consequences, it leaves the domain of more or less everyday perception and enters that of abstract consciousness, its effectiveness is seen as resulting from its inevitability, not from its visible intensity, it is the certainty of being punished and not the horrifying spectacle of public punishment that must discourage crime the exemplary mechanics of punishment changes its mechanisms. As a result, justice no longer takes public responsibility for the violence that is bound up with its practice. If it too strikes, if it too kills, it is not as a glorification of its strength, 
but as an element of itself that it is obliged to tolerate, that it finds difficult to account for. The apportioning of blame is redistributed, in punishment as spectacle a confused horror spread from the scaffold, it enveloped both executioner and condemned, and, although it was always ready to invert the shame inflicted on the victim into pity or glory, it often turned the legal violence of the executioner into shame. Now the scandal and the light are to be distributed differently, it is the conviction itself that marks the offender with the unequivocally negative sign, the publicity has shifted to the trial, and to the sentence, the execution itself is like an additional shame that justice is ashamed to impose on the condemned man, so it keeps its distance from the act, tending always to entrust it to others, under the seal of secrecy. It is ugly to be punishable, but there is no glory in punishing. Hence that double system of protection that justice has set up between itself and the punishment it imposes. Those who carry out the penalty tend to become an autonomous sector, justice is relieved of responsibility for it by a bureaucratic concealment of the penalty itself. It is typical that in France the administration of the prisons should for so long have been the responsibility of the Ministry of the Interior, while responsibility for the bonds, for penal servitude in the convict ships and penal settlements, lay with the Ministry of the Navy or the Ministry of the Colonies. And beyond this distribution of roles operates a theoretical disavowal, do not imagine that the sentences that we judges pass are activated by a desire to punish, they are intended to correct, reclaim, cure, a technique of improvement represses, in the penalty, the strict expiation of evil doing, and relieves the magistrates of the demeaning task of punishing. In modern justice and on the part of those who dispense it there is a shame in punishing, which does not always preclude zeal. This sense of shame is constantly growing, the psychologists and the minor civil servants of moral orthopedics proliferate on the wound it leaves. The disappearance of public executions marks therefore the decline of the spectacle, but it also marks a slackening of the hold on the body. In 1787, in an address to the Society for Promoting Political Inquiries, Benjamin Rush remarked, I can only hope that the time is not far away when gallows, pillory, scaffold, flogging and will will, in the history of punishment, be regarded as the marks of the barbarity of centuries and of countries and as proofs of the feeble influence of reason and religion over the human mind, teeters. 1935, 30. Indeed, 60 years later, Van Meenen, opening the Second Penitentiary Congress, in Brussels, recalled the time of his childhood as of a past age, I have seen the ground strewn with wheels, gibbets, gallows, pillories, I have seen hideously stretched skeletons on wheels, Annals de la Charite, 529-30. Branding had been abolished in England, 1834, and in France, 1832. In 1820, England no longer dared to apply the full punishment reserved for traitors, Thistlewood was not quartered. Only flogging still remained in a number of penal systems, Russia, England, Prussia. But, generally speaking, punitive practices had become more reticent. One no longer touched the body, or at least as little as possible, and then only to reach something other than the body itself. It might be objected that imprisonment, confinement, forced labor, penal servitude, Prohibition from entering certain areas, deportation which have occupied so important a place in modern penal systems are physical penalties, unlike fines, for example, they directly affect the body. But the punishment-body relation is not the same as it was in the torture during public executions. The body now serves as an instrument or intermediary, if one intervenes upon it to imprison it, or to make it work, it is in order to deprive the individual of a liberty that is regarded both as a right and as property. The body, according to this penally, is caught up in a system of constraints and privations, obligations, and prohibitions. Physical pain, the pain of the body itself, is no longer the constituent element of the penalty. From being an art of unbearable sensations punishment has become an economy of suspended rights. If it is still necessary for the law to reach and manipulate the body of the convict, it will be at a distance, in the proper way, according to strict rules, and with a much higher aim. As a result of this new restraint, a whole army of technicians took over from the executioner, the immediate anatomist of pain, warders, doctors, chaplains, psychiatrists, psychologists, educationalists, by their very presence near the prisoner, they sing the praises that the law needs, they reassure it that the body and pain are not the ultimate objects of its punitive action. Today a doctor must watch over those condemned to death, right up to the last moment thus juxtaposing himself as the agent of welfare, as the alleviator of pain with the official whose task it is to end life. This is worth thinking about. When the moment of execution approaches, the patients are injected with tranquilizers. A utopia of judicial reticence, take away life, but prevent the patient from feeling it, 
deprive the prisoner of all rights, but do not inflict pain, impose penalties free of all pain. Recourse to psychopharmacology and to various physiological disconnectors, even if it is temporary, is a logical consequence of this non-corporal penalty. The modern rituals of execution attest to this double process, the disappearance of the spectacle and the elimination of pain. The same movement has affected the various European legal systems, each at its own rate, the same death for all the execution no longer bears the specific mark of the crime or the social status of the criminal, a death that lasts only a moment no torture must be added to it in advance, no further actions performed upon the corpse, an execution that affects life rather than the body. There are no longer any of those long processes in which death was both retarded by calculated interruptions and multiplied by a series of successive attacks. There are no longer any of those combinations of tortures that were organized for the killing of regicides, or of the kind advocated, at the beginning of the 18th century, by the anonymous author of Hanging Not Punishment Enough, 1701, by which the condemned man would be broken on the wheel, then flogged until he fainted, then hung up with chains, then finally left to die slowly of hunger. There are no longer any of those executions in which the condemned man was dragged along on a hurdle, to prevent his head smashing against the cobblestones, in which his belly was opened up, his entrails quickly ripped out, so that he had time to see them, with his own eyes, being thrown on the fire, in which he was finally decapitated and his body quartered. Point one: The reduction of these thousand deaths to strict capital punishment defines a whole new morality concerning the act of punishing. As early as 1760, a hanging machine had been tried out in England for the execution of Lord Ferrer. It made use of a support, which opened under the feet of the condemned man, thus avoiding slow deaths and the altercations that occurred between victim and executioner. It was improved and finally adopted in 1783, the same year in which the traditional procession from Newgate to Tyburn was abolished, and in which the opportunity offered by the rebuilding of the prison, after the Gordon riots, was used to set up the scaffolds in Newgate itself, see Hibbert, 85-6. The celebrated Article 3 of the French Code of 1791 Every man condemned to death will have his head cut off bears this triple signification, an equal death for all, crimes of the same kind will be punished by the same kind of punishment, whatever the rank and state of the guilty man may be, in the words of the motion proposed by Gillotin and passed on December 1, 1789, one death per condemned man, obtained by a single blow, without recourse to those long and consequently cruel methods of execution, such as the gallows, denounced by L.E. Pelletier, lastly, punishment for the condemned man alone, since decapitation, the capital punishment of the nobility, was the least shaming for the criminal's family, L.E. Pelletier, 720. The guillotine, first used in March 1792, was the perfect vehicle for these principles. Death was reduced to a visible, but instantaneous event. Contact between the law, or those who carry it out, and the body of the criminal, is reduced to a split second. There is no physical confrontation, the executioner need be no more than a meticulous watchmaker. Experience and reason demonstrate that the method used in the past to cut off the head of a criminal exposed him to a torture more frightful than the loss of life alone, which is the express intention of the law, the execution should therefore be carried out in a single moment and with a single blow, examples show how difficult it is to achieve this. For the method to work perfectly, it must necessarily depend on invariable mechanical means whose force and effect may also be determined. It is an easy enough matter to have such an unfailing machine built, decapitation will be performed in a moment according to the intention of the new law. If this apparatus seems necessary, it will cause no sensation and will be scarcely noticed, St. Tedme, 161. The guillotine takes life almost without touching the body, just as prison deprives of liberty or a fine reduces wealth. It is intended to apply the law not so much to a real body capable of feeling pain as to a juridical subject, the possessor, among other rights of the right to exist. It had to have the abstraction of the law itself. No doubt something of the old public execution was, for a time, superimposed in France on the sobriety of the new method. Parasites and the regicides who were regarded as such were led to the scaffold wearing a black veil, there, until 1832, one of their hands was cut off. Thereafter, nothing remained but the ornamental crepe. Thus it was in the case of Fieschi, the would-be assassin of Louis Philippe. In November 1836, he will be taken to the place of execution wearing a shirt, barefoot, his head covered with a black veil, he will be exhibited upon a scaffold while an usher reads the sentence to the people, and he will be immediately executed. We should remember Damien's and note that the last addition to penal death was a mourning veil. The condemned man was no longer to be seen. 
only the reading of the sentence on the scaffold announced the crime and that crime must be faceless. The more monstrous a criminal was, the more he must be deprived of light, he must not see, or be seen. This was a common enough notion at the time. For the parasite one should construct an iron cage or dig an impenetrable dungeon that would serve him as an eternal retreat de Moline, 2757. The last vestige of the great public execution was its annulment, a drapery to hide a body. Benoit, triply infamous, his mother's murderer, a homosexual, an assassin, was the first of the parasites not to have a hand cut off, as the sentence was being read, he stood on the scaffold supported by the executioners. It was a horrible sight, wrapped in a large white shroud, his face covered with black crepe, the parasite escaped the gaze of the silent crowd, and beneath these mysterious and gloomy clothes, life was manifested only by frightful cries, which soon expired under the knife, Gazette des Tribunaux, August 30, 1832. At the beginning of the 19th century, then, the great spectacle of physical punishment disappeared, the tortured body was avoided, the theatrical representation of pain was excluded from punishment. The age of sobriety in punishment had begun. By 1830-48, public executions, preceded by torture, had almost entirely disappeared. Of course, this generalization requires some qualification. To begin with, the changes did not come about at once or as part of a single process. There were delays. Paradoxically, England was one of the countries most loath to see the disappearance of the public execution, perhaps because of the role of model that the institution of the jury, public hearings, and respect of habeas corpus had given to her criminal law, above all, no doubt, because she did not wish to diminish the rigor of her penal laws during the great social disturbances of the years 1780-1820. For a long time Romilly, Mackintosh, and Fowell Buxton failed in their attempts to attenuate the multiplicity and severity of the penalties laid down by English law that horrible butchery, as Rossi described it. Its severity, in fact, the juries regarded the penalties laid down as excessive and were consequently more lenient in their application, had even increased. In 1760, Blackstone had listed 160 capital crimes in English legislation, while by 1819 there were 223. One should also take into account the advances and retreats that the process as a whole underwent between 1760 and 1840, the rapidity of reform in certain countries such as Austria, Russia, the United States, France under the Constituent Assembly, then the retreat at the time of the counter-revolutions in Europe and the great social fear of the years 1820-48, more or less temporary changes introduced by emergency courts or laws, the gap between the laws and the real practice of the courts, which was by no means a faithful reflection of the state of legislation. All these factors account for the irregularity of the transformation that occurred at the turn of the century. It should be added that, although most of the changes had been achieved by 1840, although the mechanisms of punishment had by then assumed their new way of functioning, the process was far from complete. The reduction in the use of torture was a tendency that was rooted in the great transformation of the years 1760-1840, but it did not end there, it can be said that the practice of the public execution haunted our penal system for a long time and still haunts it today. In France, the guillotine, that machine for the production of rapid and discreet deaths, represented a new ethic of legal death. But the revolution had immediately endowed it with a great theatrical ritual. For years it provided a spectacle. It had to be removed to the barrier Saint-Jacques, the open cart was replaced by a closed carriage, the condemned man was hustled from the vehicle straight to the scaffold, hasty executions were organized at unexpected times. In the end, the guillotine had to be placed inside prison walls and made inaccessible to the public, after the execution of Weidman in 1939 by blocking the streets leading to the prison in which the scaffold was hidden, and in which the execution would take place in secret, the execution of Buffet and Bon Tom at the Santa in 1972. Witnesses who described the scene could even be prosecuted, thereby ensuring that the execution should cease to be a spectacle and remain a strange secret between the law and those it condemns. One has only to point out so many precautions to realize that capital punishment remains fundamentally, even today, a spectacle that must actually be forbidden. Similarly, the hold on the body did not entirely disappear in the mid-19th century. Punishment had no doubt ceased to be centered on torture as a technique of pain, it assumed as its principal object loss of wealth or rights. But a punishment like forced labor or even imprisonment mere loss of liberty has never functioned without a certain additional element of punishment that certainly concerns the body itself, rationing of food, sexual deprivation, corporal punishment, solitary confinement. Are these the unintentional, but inevitable, consequence of imprisonment? In fact, 
in its most explicit practices, imprisonment has always involved a certain degree of physical pain. The criticism that was often leveled at the penitentiary system in the early 19th century, imprisonment is not a sufficient punishment, prisoners are less hungry, less cold, less deprived in general than many poor people or even workers, suggests a postulate that was never explicitly denied, it is just that a condemned man should suffer physically more than other men. It is difficult to dissociate punishment from additional physical pain. What would a non-corporal punishment be? There remains, therefore, a trace of torture in the modern mechanisms of criminal justice a trace that has not been entirely overcome, but which is enveloped, increasingly, by the non-corporal nature of the penal system. The reduction in penal severity in the last 200 years is a phenomenon with which legal historians are well acquainted. But, for a long time, it has been regarded in an overall way as a quantitative phenomenon, less cruelty, less pain, more kindness, more respect, more humanity. In fact, these changes are accompanied by a displacement in the very object of the punitive operation. Is there a diminution of intensity? Perhaps. There is certainly a change of objective. If the penalty in its most severe forms no longer addresses itself to the body, on what does it lay hold? The answer of the theoreticians those who, about 1760, opened up a new period that is not yet at an end is simple, almost obvious. It seems to be contained in the question itself, since it is no longer the body, it must be the soul. The expiation that once rained down upon the body must be replaced by a punishment that acts in depth on the heart, the thoughts, the will, the inclinations. Mably formulated the principle once and for all, punishment, if I may so put it, should strike the soul rather than the body, Mably, 326. It was an important moment. The old partners of the spectacle of punishment, the body, and the blood, gave way. A new character came on the scene, masked. It was the end of a certain kind of tragedy, comedy began, with shadow play, faceless voices, impalpable entities. The apparatus of punitive justice must now bite into this bodiless reality. Is this any more than a mere theoretical assertion, contradicted by penal practice? Such a conclusion would be overhasty. It is true that, today, to punish is not simply a matter of converting a soul, but Mably's principle has not remained a pious wish. Its effects can be felt throughout modern penally. To begin with, there is a substitution of objects. By this I do not mean that one has suddenly set about punishing other crimes. No doubt the definition of offenses, the hierarchy of their seriousness, the margins of indulgence, what was tolerated in fact and what was legally permitted all this has considerably changed over the last 200 years, many crimes have ceased to be so because they were bound up with a certain exercise of religious authority or a particular type of economic activity, blasphemy has lost its status as a crime, smuggling and domestic larceny some of their seriousness. But these displacements are perhaps not the most important fact the division between the permitted and the forbidden has preserved a certain constancy from one century to another. On the other hand, crime, the object with which penal practice is concerned, has profoundly altered, the quality, the nature, in a sense the substance of which the punishable element is made, rather than its formal definition. Under cover of the relative stability of the law, a mass of subtle and rapid changes has occurred. Certainly the crimes and offenses on which judgment is passed are juridical objects defined by the code but judgment is also passed on the passions, instincts, anomalies, infirmities, maladjustments, effects of environment or heredity, acts of aggression are punished, so also, through them, is aggressivity, rape, but at the same time perversions, murders, but also drives and desires. But, it will be objected, judgment is not actually being passed on them, if they are referred to at all it is to explain the actions in question, and to determine to what extent the, the subject's will was involved in the crime. This is no answer. For it is these shadows lurking behind the case itself that are judged and punished. They are judged indirectly as attenuating circumstances that introduce into the verdict not only circumstantial evidence, but something quite different, which is not juridically codifiable, the knowledge of the criminal, one's estimation of him, what is known about the relations between him, his past and his crime, and what might be expected of him in the future. They are also judged by the interplay of all those notions that have circulated between medicine and jurisprudence since the 19th century, the monsters of Georgette's times, show me as psychical anomalies, the perverts and maladjusted of our own experts, and which, behind the pretext of explaining an action, are ways of defining an individual. They are punished by means of a punishment that has the function of making the offender not only desirous, but also capable, of living within the law and of providing for his own needs they are punished by the internal economy of a penalty which, 
while intended to punish the crime, may be altered, shortened or, in certain cases, extended, according to changes in the prisoner's behavior, and they are punished by the security measures that accompany the penalty, prohibition of entering certain areas, probation, obligatory medical treatment, and which are intended not to punish the offense, but to supervise the individual, to neutralize his dangerous state of mind, to alter his criminal tendencies, and to continue even when this change has been achieved. The criminal soul is not referred to in the trial merely to explain his crime and as a factor in the juridical apportioning of responsibility, if it is brought before the court, with such pomp and circumstance, such concern to understand and such scientific application, it is because it too, as well as the crime itself, is to be judged and to share in the punishment. Throughout the penal ritual, from the preliminary investigation to the sentence and the final effects of the penalty, a domain has been penetrated by objects that not only duplicate, but also dissociate the juridically defined and coded objects. Psychiatric expertise, but also in a more general way criminal anthropology and the repetitive discourse of criminology, find one of their precise functions here, by solemnly inscribing offenses in the field of objects susceptible of scientific knowledge, they provide the mechanisms of legal punishment with a justifiable hold not only on offenses, but on individuals, not only on what they do, but also on what they are, will be, may be. The additional factor of the offender's soul, which the legal system has laid hold of, is only apparently explanatory and limitative, and is in fact expansionist. During the 150 or 200 years that Europe has been setting up its new penal systems, the judges have gradually, by means of a process that goes back very far indeed, taken to judging something other than crimes, namely, the soul of the criminal. And, by that very fact, they have begun to do something other than pass judgment. Or, to be more precise, within the very judicial modality of judgment, other types of assessment have slipped in, profoundly altering its rules of elaboration. Ever since the Middle Ages slowly and painfully built up the great procedure of investigation, to judge was to establish the truth of a crime, it was to determine its author and to apply a legal punishment. Knowledge of the offense, knowledge of the offender, knowledge of the law, these three conditions made it possible to ground a judgment in truth. But now a quite different question of truth is inscribed in the course of the penal judgment. The question is no longer simply, has the act been established and is it punishable? But also, what is this act, what is this act of violence or this murder? To what level or to what field of reality does it belong? Is it a fantasy, a psychotic reaction, a delusional episode, a perverse action? It is no longer simply, who committed it? But, how can we assign the causal process that produced it? Where did it originate in the author himself? Instinct, unconscious, environment, heredity. It is no longer simply, what law punishes this offense? But, what would be the most appropriate measures to take? How do we see the future development of the offender? What would be the best way of rehabilitating him? A whole set of assessing, diagnostic, prognostic, normative judgments concerning the criminal have become lodged in the framework of penal judgment. Another truth has penetrated the truth that was required by the legal machinery, a truth which, entangled with the first, has turned the assertion of guilt into a strange scientifico-juridical complex. A significant fact is the way in which the question of madness has evolved in penal practice. According to the 1810 Code, madness was dealt with only in terms of Article 64. Now this article states that there is neither crime nor offense if the offender was of unsound mind at the time of the act. The possibility of ascertaining madness was, therefore, a quite separate matter from the definition of an act as a crime, the gravity of the act was not altered by the fact that its author was insane, nor the punishment reduced as a consequence, the crime itself disappeared. It was impossible, therefore, to declare that someone was both guilty and mad, once the diagnosis of madness had been accepted, it could not be included in the judgment, it interrupted the procedure and loosened the hold of the law on the author of the act. Not only the examination of the criminal suspected of insanity, but the very effects of this examination had to be external and anterior to the sentence. But, very soon, the courts of the 19th century began to misunderstand the meaning of Article 64. Despite several decisions of the Supreme Court of Appeal confirming that insanity could not result either in a light penalty, or even in an acquittal, but required that the case be dismissed, the ordinary courts continued to bring the question of insanity to bear on their verdicts. They accepted that one could be both guilty and mad, less guilty the matter one was, guilty certainly, but someone to be put away and treated rather than punished, not only a guilty man, but also dangerous, since quite obviously sick, etc. From the point of view of the penal code, 
the result was a mass of juridical absurdities. But this was the starting point of an evolution that jurisprudence and legislation itself was to precipitate in the course of the next 150 years, already the reform of 1832, introducing attenuating circumstances, made it possible to modify the sentence according to the supposed degrees of an illness or the forms of a semi-insanity. And the practice of calling on psychiatric expertise, which is widespread in the assize courts and sometimes extended to courts of summary jurisdiction, means that the sentence, even if it is always formulated in terms of legal punishment, implies, more or less obscurely, judgments of normality, attributions of causality, assessments of possible changes, anticipations as to the offender's future. It would be wrong to say that all these operations give substance to a judgment from the outside, they are directly integrated in the process of forming the sentence. Instead of insanity eliminating the crime according to the original meaning of Article 64, every crime and even every offense now carries within it, as a legitimate suspicion, but also as a right that may be claimed, the hypothesis of insanity, in any case of anomaly. And the sentence that condemns or acquits is not simply a judgment of guilt, a legal decision that lays down punishment, it bears within it an assessment of normality and a technical prescription for a possible normalization. Today the judge magistrate or juror certainly does more than judge and he is not alone in judging. Throughout the penal procedure and the implementation of the sentence there swarms a whole series of subsidiary authorities. Small-scale legal systems and parallel judges have multiplied around the principal judgment, psychiatric or psychological experts, magistrates concerned with the implementation of sentences, educationalists, members of the prison service, all fragment the legal power to punish, it might be objected that none of them really shares the right to judge, that some, after sentence is passed, have no other right than to implement the punishment laid down by the court and, above all, that others they experts intervene before the sentence not to pass judgment, but to assist the judges in their decision. But as soon as the penalties and the security measures defined by the court are not absolutely determined, from the moment they may be modified along the way, from the moment one leaves to others than the judges of the offense the task of deciding whether the condemned man deserves to be placed in semi-liberty or conditional liberty, whether they may bring his penal tutelage to an end one is handing over to them mechanisms of legal punishment to be used at their discretion, subsidiary judges. They may be, but they are judges all the same. The whole machinery that has been developing for years around the implementation of sentences, and their adjustment to individuals, creates a proliferation of the authorities of judicial decision-making and extends its powers of decision well beyond the sentence. The psychiatric experts, for their part, may well refrain from judging. Let us examine the three questions to which, since the 1958 ruling, they have to address themselves, does the convicted person represent a danger to society? Is he susceptible to penal punishment? Is he curable or readjustable? These questions have nothing to do with Article 64, nor with the possible insanity of the convicted person at the moment of the act. They do not concern responsibility. They concern nothing but the administration of the penalty, its necessity, its usefulness, its possible effectiveness, they make it possible to show in an almost transparent vocabulary, whether the mental hospital would be a more suitable place of confinement than the prison, whether this confinement should be short or long, whether medical treatment or security measures are called for. What, then, is the role of the psychiatrist in penal matters? He is not an expert in responsibility, but an advisor on punishment, it is up to him to say whether the subject is dangerous, in what way one should be protected from him, how one should intervene to alter him whether it would be better to try to force him into submission or to treat him. At the very beginning of its history, psychiatric expertise was called upon to formulate true propositions as to the part that the liberty of the offender had played in the act he had committed, it is now called upon to suggest a prescription for what might be called his medico-judicial treatment. To sum up, ever since the new penal system that defined by the great codes of the 18th and 19th centuries has been in operation, a general process has led judges to judge something other than crimes they have been led in their sentences to do something other than judge, and the power of judging has been transferred, in part, to other authorities than the judges of the offense. The whole penal operation has taken on extrajuridical elements and personnel. It will be said that there is nothing extraordinary in this, that it is part of the destiny of the law to absorb little by little elements that are alien to it. But what is odd about modern criminal justice is that, although it has taken on so many extrajuridical elements, it has done so not in order to be able to define them juridically and gradually to integrate them into the actual power to punish, on the contrary, it has done so in order to make them function within the penal operation as non-juridical elements, in order to stop this operation being simply a legal punishment, in order to exculpate the judge from being purely and simply he who punishes. 
Of course, we pass sentence, but this sentence is not in direct relation to the crime. It is quite clear that for us it functions as a way of treating a criminal. We punish, but this is a way of saying that we wish to obtain a cure. Today, criminal justice functions and justifies itself only by this perpetual reference to something other than itself, by this unceasing reinscription in non-juridical systems. Its fate is to be redefined by knowledge. Beneath the increasing leniency of punishment, then, one may map a displacement of its point of application, and through this displacement, a whole field of recent objects, a whole new system of truth and a mass of roles hitherto unknown in the exercise of criminal justice. A corpus of knowledge, techniques, scientific discourses is formed and becomes entangled with the practice of the power to punish. This book is intended as a correlative history of the modern soul and of a new power to judge, a genealogy of the present scientifico-legal complex from which the power to punish derives its bases, justifications, and rules, from which it extends its effects and by which it masks its exorbitant singularity. But from what point can such a history of the modern soul on trial be written? If one confined oneself to the evolution of legislation or of penal procedures, one would run the risk of allowing a change in the collective sensibility, an increase in humanization or the development of the human sciences to emerge as a massive, external, inert, and primary fact. By studying only the general social forms, as Durkheim did, cf. bibliography, one runs the risk of positing as the principle of greater leniency in punishment processes of individualization that are rather one of the effects of the new tactics of power, among which are to be included the new penal mechanisms. This study obeys four general rules. One do not concentrate the study of the punitive mechanisms on their repressive effects alone, on their punishment aspects alone, but situate them in a whole series of their possible positive effects, even if these seem marginal at first sight. As a consequence, regard punishment as a complex social function. To analyze punitive methods not simply as consequences of legislation or as indicators of social structures, but as techniques possessing their own specificity in the more general field of other ways of exercising power. Regard punishment as a political tactic. 3. Instead of treating the history of penal law and the history of the human sciences as two separate series whose overlapping appears to have had on one or the other, or perhaps on both, a disturbing or useful effect, according to one's point of view, see whether there is not some common matrix or whether they do not both derive from a single process of epistemologico-juridical formation, in short, make the technology of power the very principle both of the humanization of the penal system and of the knowledge of man. 4. Try to discover whether this entry of the soul onto the scene of penal justice, and with it the insertion in legal practice of a whole corpus of scientific knowledge, is not the effect of a transformation of the way in which the body itself is invested by power relations. In short, try to study the metamorphosis of punitive methods on the basis of a political technology of the body in which might be read a common history of power relations and object relations. Thus, by an analysis of penal leniency as a technique of power, one might understand both how man, the soul, the normal or abnormal individual have come to duplicate crime as objects of penal intervention, and in what way a specific mode of subjection was able to give birth to man as an object of knowledge for a discourse with a scientific status. But I am not claiming to be the first to have worked in this direction. Point two. Rush and Kirchheimer's great work, Punishment and Social Structures, provides a number of essential reference points. We must first rid ourselves of the illusion that penally is above all, if not exclusively, a means of reducing crime and that, in this role, According to the social forms, the political systems or beliefs, it may be severe or lenient, tend towards expiation of obtaining redress, towards the pursuit of individuals or the attribution of collective responsibility. We must analyze rather the concrete systems of punishment, study them as social phenomena that cannot be accounted for by the juridical structure of society alone, nor by its fundamental ethical choices, we must situate them in their field of operation, in which the punishment of crime is not the sole element we must show that punitive measures are not simply negative mechanisms that make it possible to repress, to prevent, to exclude, to eliminate, but that they are linked to a whole series of positive and useful effects which it is their task to support, and, in this sense, although legal punishment is carried out in order to punish offenses, one might say that the definition of offenses and their prosecution are carried out in turn in order to maintain the punitive mechanisms and their functions. From this point of view, Rush and Kirchheimer relate the different systems of punishment with the systems of production within which they operate, thus, in a slave economy, punitive mechanisms serve to provide an additional labor force and to constitute a body of civil slaves in addition to those provided by war or trading, with feudalism, at a time when money and production were still at an early stage of development, we find a sudden increase in corporal punishments the body being in. Most cases the only property accessible, the penitentiary, 
the Hopital General, the Spin Hughes, or the Rasp Hughes, forced labor and the prison factory appear with the development of the mercantile economy. But the industrial system requires a free market in labor and, in the 19th century, the role of forced labor in the mechanisms of punishment diminishes accordingly and corrective detention takes its place. There are no doubt a number of observations to be made about such a strict correlation. But we can surely accept the general proposition that, in our societies, the systems of punishment are to be situated in a certain political economy of the body, even if they do not make use of violent or bloody punishment, even when they use lenient methods involving confinement or correction, it is always the body that is at issue the body and its forces, their utility and their docility, their distribution and their submission. It is certainly legitimate to write a history of punishment against the background of moral ideas or legal structures. But can one write such a history against the background of a history of bodies, when such systems of punishment claim to have only the secret souls of criminals as their objective? Historians long ago began to write the history of the body. They have studied the body in the field of historical demography or pathology, they have considered it as the seat of needs and appetites, as the locus of physiological processes and metabolisms, as a target for the attacks of germs or viruses, they have shown to what extent historical processes were involved in what might seem to be the purely biological base of existence, and what place should be given in the history of society to biological events such as the circulation of bacilli, or the extension of the lifespan, CFLE Roy Logery. But the body is also directly involved in a political field, power relations have an immediate hold upon it, they invest it, mark it, train it, torture it, force it to carry out tasks, to perform ceremonies, to emit signs. This political investment of the body is bound up, in accordance with complex reciprocal relations, with its economic use, it is largely as a force of production that the body is invested with relations of power and domination, but, on the other hand, its constitution as labor power is possible only if it is caught up in a system of subjection, in which need is also a political instrument meticulously prepared, calculated, and used, the body becomes a useful force only if it is both a productive body and a subjected body. This subjection is not only obtained by the instruments of violence or ideology, it can also be direct, physical, pitting force against force, bearing on material elements, and yet without involving violence, it may be calculated, organized, technically thought out, it may be subtle, make use neither of weapons nor of terror and yet remain of a physical order. That is to say, there may be a knowledge of the body that is not exactly the science of its functioning, and a mastery of its forces that is more than the ability to conquer them, this knowledge and this mastery constitute what might be called the political technology of the body. Of course, this technology is diffuse, rarely formulated in continuous, systematic discourse, it is often made up of bits and pieces, it implements a disparate set of tools or methods. In spite of the coherence of its results, it is generally no more than a multiform instrumentation. Moreover, it cannot be localized in a particular type of institution or state apparatus. For they have recourse to it, they use, select, or impose certain of its methods. But, in its mechanisms and its effects, it is situated at a quite different level. What the apparatuses and institutions operate is, in a sense, a microphysics of power, whose field of validity is situated in a sense between these great functionings and the bodies themselves with their materiality and their forces. Now, the study of this microphysics presupposes that the power exercised on the body is conceived not as a property, but as a strategy, that its effects of domination are attributed not to appropriation, but to dispositions, maneuvers, tactics, techniques, functionings, that one should decipher in it a network of relations, constantly in tension, in activity, rather than a privilege that one might possess that one should take as its model a perpetual battle rather than a contract. Regulating a transaction or the conquest of a territory. In short this power is exercised rather than possessed, it is not the privilege, acquired or preserved, of the dominant class, but the overall effect of its strategic positions and effect that is manifested and sometimes extended by the position of those who are dominated. Furthermore, this power is not exercised simply as an obligation or a prohibition on those who do not have it, it invests them is transmitted by them and through them, it exerts pressure upon them, just as they themselves, in their struggle against it, resist the grip it has on them. This means that these relations go right down into the depths of society, that they are not localized in the relations between the state and its citizens or on the frontier between classes and that they do not merely reproduce, at the level of individuals, bodies, gestures, and behavior, the general form of the law or government, that, although there is continuity, they are indeed articulated on this form through a whole series of complex mechanisms, there is neither analogy nor homology, but a specificity of mechanism and modality. 
Lastly, they are not univocal, they define innumerable points of confrontation, focuses of instability, each of which has its own risks of conflict, of struggles, and of an at least temporary inversion of the power relations. The overthrow of these micropowers does not, then, obey the law of all or nothing, it is not acquired once and for all by a new control of the apparatuses nor by a new functioning or a destruction of the institutions, on the other hand, none of its localized episodes may be inscribed in history except by the effects that it induces on the entire network in which it is caught up. Perhaps, too, we should abandon a whole tradition that allows us to imagine that knowledge can exist only where the power relations are suspended and that knowledge can develop only outside its injunctions, its demands, and its interests. Perhaps we should abandon the belief that power makes mad and that, by the same token, the renunciation of power is one of the conditions of knowledge. We should admit rather that power produces knowledge, and not simply by encouraging it because it serves power or by applying it because it is useful, that power and knowledge directly imply one another that there is no power relation without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge, nor any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute at the same time power relations. These power-knowledge relations are to be analyzed, therefore, not on the basis of a subject of knowledge who is or is not free in relation to the power system, but, on the contrary, the subject who knows, the objects to be known and the modalities of knowledge must be regarded as so many effects of these fundamental implications of power-knowledge and their historical transformations. In short, it is not the activity of the subject of knowledge that produces a corpus of knowledge, useful or resistant to power, but power knowledge, the processes and struggles that traverse it and of which it is made up, that determines the forms and possible domains of knowledge. To analyze the political investment of the body and the microphysics of power presupposes, therefore, that one abandons where power is concerned the violence ideology opposition, the metaphor of property, the model of the contract or of conquest, that where knowledge is concerned one abandons the opposition between what is interested and what is disinterested, the model of knowledge and the primacy of the subject. Borrowing a word from Petty and his contemporaries, but giving it a different meaning from the one current in the 17th century, one might imagine a political anatomy. This would not be the study of a state in terms of a body, with its elements, its resources, and its forces, nor would it be the study of the body and its surroundings in terms of a small state. One would be concerned with the body politic, as a set of material elements and techniques that serve as weapons, relays, communication routes and supports for the power and knowledge relations that invest human bodies and subjugate them by turning them into objects of knowledge. It is a question of situating the techniques of punishment whether they seize the body in the ritual of public torture and execution or whether they are addressed to the soul in the history of this body politic, of considering penal practices less as a consequence of legal theories than as a chapter of political anatomy. Kantorowicz gives a remarkable analysis of the king's body, a double body according to the juridical theology of the Middle Ages, since it involves not only the transitory element that is born and dies, but another that remains unchanged by time and is maintained as the physical yet intangible support of the kingdom, around this duality, which was originally close to the Christological model, are organized an iconography, a political theory of monarchy, legal mechanisms that distinguish between as well as link the person of the king and the demands of the crown, and a whole ritual that reaches its height in the coronation, the funeral and the ceremonies of submission. At the opposite pole one might imagine placing the body of the condemned man, he, too, has his legal status, he gives rise to his own ceremonial and he calls forth a whole theoretical discourse, not in order to ground the surplus power possessed by the person of the sovereign, but in order to code the lack of power with which those subjected to punishment are marked. In the darkest region of the political field the condemned man represents the symmetrical, inverted figure of the king. We should analyze what might be called, in homage to Kantorowicz, the least body of the condemned man. If the surplus power possessed by the king gives rise to the duplication of his body, has not the surplus power exercised on the subjected body of the condemned man given rise to another type of duplication? That of a non-corporal, a soul, as Mabley called it. The history of this microphysics of the punitive power would then be a genealogy or an element in a genealogy of the modern soul. Rather than seeing this soul as the reactivated remnants of an ideology, one would see it as the present correlative of a certain technology of power over the body. It would be wrong to say that the soul is an illusion, or an ideological effect. On the contrary, it exists, it has a reality, it is produced permanently around, on, within the body by the functioning of a power that is exercised on those punished and, in a more general way, on those one supervises, trains and corrects, over madmen, children at home and at school, the colonized over those who are stuck at a machine and supervised for the rest of their lives. This is the historical reality of this soul, which, 
unlike the soul represented by Christian theology, is not born in sin and subject to punishment, but is born rather out of methods of punishment, supervision, and constraint. This real, non-corporal soul is not a substance, it is the element in which are articulated the effects of a certain type of power and the reference of a certain type of knowledge, the machinery by which the power relations give rise to a possible corpus of knowledge, and knowledge extends and reinforces the effects of this power. On this reality reference, various concepts have been constructed and domains of analysis carved out, psyche, subjectivity, personality, consciousness, etc. On it have been built scientific techniques and discourses, and the moral claims of humanism. But let there be no misunderstanding, it is not that a real man, the object of knowledge, philosophical reflection, or technical intervention, has been substituted for the soul, the illusion of the theologians. The man described for us, whom we are invited to free, is already in himself the effect of a subjection much more profound than himself. A soul inhabits him and brings him to existence, which is itself a factor in the mastery that power exercises over the body. The soul is the effect and instrument of a political anatomy, the soul is the prison of the body. That punishment in general and the prison in particular belong to a political technology of the body is a lesson that I have learned not so much from history as from the present. In recent years, prison revolts have occurred throughout the world. There was certainly something paradoxical about their aims, their slogans, and the way they took place. They were revolts against an entire state of physical misery that is over a century old, against cold, suffocation and overcrowding, against decrepit walls, hunger, physical maltreatment. But they were also revolts against model prisons, tranquilizers, isolation, the medical or educational services. Were they revolts whose aims were merely material? Or contradictory revolts, against the obsolete? but also against comfort, against the warders, but also against the psychiatrists. In fact, all these movements and the innumerable discourses that the prison has given rise to since the early 19th century have been about the body and material things. What has sustained these discourses, these memories, and invectives are indeed those minute material details. One may, if one is so disposed, see them as no more than blind demands or suspect the existence behind them of alien strategies. In fact, they were revolts, at the level of the body, against the very body of the prison. What was at issue was not whether the prison environment was too harsh or too aseptic, too primitive, or too efficient, but its very materiality as an instrument and vector of power, it is this whole technology of power over the body that the technology of the soul that of the educationalists, psychologists, and psychiatrists fails either to conceal or to compensate, for the simple reason that it is one of its tools. I would like to write the history of this prison, with all the political investments of the body that it gathers together in its closed architecture. Why? Simply because I am interested in the past? No, if one means by that writing a history of the past in terms of the present. Yes, if one means writing the history of the present. Point three.